Hey guys, it's Chris. From psycho ex-boyfriends to celebrity crushes turned into deadly obsessions. Here are nine cases of when stalking goes wrong. Number nine, Jacqueline Aids. A woman from Maricopa County, Arizona named Jacqueline Aids decided she wanted to date an established man. So she signed up on a dating website for women seeking millionaires. She went on one date with a man who decided he wasn't interested in pursuing a relationship. But AIDS persisted to the point where her behavior became criminal, sending him at least 159,000 text messages over the following 10 months. Officers escorted her from the man's property in 2017, but instead of taking this as a sign to back off, her harassment escalated. Her nonstop text messages became threatening and gruesome including her expressed desires to wear his flesh, devour his organs, and make sushi out of his kidneys and chopsticks from his hand bones. In 2018, when her victim was out of the country, AIDS broke into his house. He saw her on his home surveillance footage and called police, who found her inside taking a bath. Meanwhile, officers discovered a butcher knife in the front seat of her car. AIDS was arrested and held at the Maricopa County Jail after skipping multiple court dates. While there, AIDS said that she believed a jury would find her innocent and want her victim to marry her, even turning down a plea deal that would have helped resolve the case. She also told the press that Walt Disney had abducted her at one point in her life and that she was a member of the Illuminati. The woman was eventually deemed mentally incompetent to stand trial and the charges against her were dropped. A person in their right mind would probably be thankful for this, but AIDS was thoroughly convinced that people would believe in her innocence and insisted on having her case heard out by a jury. Well, that never happened, and she still got off the hook for her behavior after two of three court-appointed psychologists decided that her mental health was non-restorable. AIDS was then taken to a local psychiatric facility for a short stay amid plans from her parents to pick her up and move her to Florida to live with them. Wonder why, she sounds like a keeper. Number eight, Richard Farley. Richard Wade Farley began stalking a coworker in 1984 named Laura Black, who he worked with at the Electromagnetic Systems Lab in Sunnyvale, California. They met at a company event, and after Black rejected Farley, he started sending her unwanted gifts, showing up at her aerobics classes and repeatedly calling her at work. Somehow, he obtained her phone number and home address, and he got his hands on a copy of her desk keys, which he then used to rifle through her belongings. Farley also started sending Black at least two letters a week. Desperate to end the unwelcome advances, Black sought help from her workspace's human resources department. ESL ordered Farley to attend counseling, and he complied. For a while, but then he continued the harassment. Black tried her best to ignore him, but of course that wasn't easy and she put up with this for four years. Her life was turned upside down. One day, Black found a package in her car with a copy of her house keys inside. She filed for a temporary restraining order with a court date scheduled for several weeks later to make it permanent. And this unfortunately never happened. The day before the court date, Farley drove to the ESL parking lot with a motorhome full of guns. He would later claim that his plan was to wait for Black to leave and command her to rescind the restraining order. If she refused, he would commit suicide. Instead, he shot the glass out of a side door and entered the building, and shot several of the employees that worked there. Farley also shot Black with intent to kill, but missed and only hit her shoulder. He shot 98 rounds altogether, killing seven people and wounding four. The deranged murderer was put on death row, but even then, he continued to write to Black from prison. She moved several times, and each time, he somehow managed to find her. Meanwhile, he claimed to be innocent, but in 2009, his conviction was upheld. Number seven, Brian Hill. The next case on today's list proves that catfishing can have potentially deadly consequences. Over a decade ago, a man from South Africa used a swimsuit model's photo to fake a female identity online and start a relationship with a man named Brian Curtis Hill. The phony romance went on for several years before Hill realized in 2011 that he was corresponding with a man. Hill was in rage and misdirected his anger at the woman in the photos, even though she had nothing to do with the catfishing. He learned that she lived in San Diego with her boyfriend and decided they both deserved to die. A chilling FBI affidavit reported that Hill wanted her death to be slow and painful. He boarded a San Diego bus bound equipped with a shopping list to buy duct tape, zip ties, chloroform, a knife, and a trench coat. 
He had information about the victim, including her address, family members' names and addresses, and even her favorite restaurant. Aware of his outrage, Hill's family became concerned and contacted law enforcement. Police intercepted the scorned maniac and arrested him just miles from the woman's house on two counts of interstate stalking, a serious federal charge that carries various sentences depending on the severity of the crime and if the victim was harmed. Because the Fed stopped Hill before he could harm his intended targets, he faced a maximum sentence of just five years, which seems pretty forgiving considering his plans to murder two people. What do you think? Did he get off too easy? Let me know in the comments below, and don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. Number 6. Derek Knowles In April 2012, a woman living in Salford, England filed for a five-year restraining order against her stalker, a truck driver named Derek Knowles, who incessantly called and texted her for months after their relationship ended. But as often goes with stalkers, Knowles ignored the restraining order. He began texting local radio stations and having unsuspecting DJs give shoutouts to the victim describing her as the man's future bride and pretending to be a mutual friend of the couple, wondering if the two were getting married. Knowles also sent messages speaking in third person and saying he was sorry to hear about their breakup and even sent a shout out to himself pretending to be the victim. In one message on the radio with Lynn Parsons, he referred to himself as Tim and said, hi Lynn, could you please say hi to the beautiful victim's name? We'll see you later for coffee. A colleague who knew about the woman's problematic ex-boyfriend alerted her to Knowles' unwelcome announcements, prompting her to call the radio station and then go to the police. An investigation yielded evidence of the stalker placing 10 text message requests to the radio DJs directed at the victim. When Knowles found himself back in court over his misconduct, he admitted breaching the restraining order but claimed he was in a new relationship and had no desire to contact the woman he wouldn't leave alone for so long. A judge sentenced him to six months in prison, but suspended the sentence for two years and ordered the offender to perform 100 hours of community service. Number 5. Michelle Moot Ready A bizarre press release from an alleged production company called Bodega Cats claimed that one of the company's founders, a woman named Michelle, had married Saturday Night Live cast member Pete Davidson. The statement went on to say that Michelle and Pete were childhood friends who co-founded Bodega Cats. Davidson's representatives were quick to clarify that he did not get married, that Bodega Cats was not his company, and that he was unacquainted with whoever put out the statement. The bogus press release was pulled shortly thereafter. Days later, one of Davidson's relatives found a woman sitting on his dining room table in his Staten Island home. Apparently, she entered through an open side door. The woman, Michelle Mootready, told police that she and Pete shared a so-called telepathic love connection. She was charged with felony burglary and also faces misdemeanor level harassment, criminal trespassing, and stalking charges. A judge granted no contact orders for protection against the woman to Davidson and his roommates. The comedian's representatives don't have a lot to say about the ongoing criminal case, but this is a great example of how a celebrity crush can turn into an obsession. Number 4. Richard Jan. Having a stalker can be extremely traumatic and potentially life-threatening, often forcing victims to change their lives in major ways in an effort to evade their pursuers. The year was 1996. A social worker named Shauna Bailey, who was a member of a mental health assessment team, summoned to the London home of a man named Richard Jan at the request of his mother. Jan, a biochemist, began calling Bailey, remaining silent on the other end. His harassment escalated quickly. He even attempted to torch her car and attack her twice, in one instance using a brick to beat her in the face repeatedly. Fearing for her life, Bailey quit her job and went into hiding in 2001, assuming an entirely new identity to protect herself from Jan. She reportedly sought help from police throughout all of this and later criticized law enforcement for not doing enough to help her or investigate the crimes. Meanwhile, Jan stalked and tortured at least 200 other women and ignored police warnings to leave Bailey alone. In February 2003, six and a half years after Bailey's horror began, the case was handed over to a new investigator, and Jan was finally detained. Shocked that the stalker got away with his behavior for so long, a judge sentenced him to life in prison. Prosecutors criticized the police for their alleged history of incompetence and inaction in the case of what had popularly become known as Britain's worst stalker. Number 3. Gary Della Penta In 1999, Gary Della Penta was the first person to become convicted of cyber-stalking under a newly passed law in California. 
Just weeks after the legislation passed, Della Penta was arrested for using the internet to solicit the rape of a North Hollywood woman who had repeatedly rejected him. Using the victim's name and address, the deranged criminal placed online ads claiming she had a rape fantasy and included instructions on how to disarm her security system. Men began making obscene calls to the woman and six even showed up at her home, some in the middle of the night, prepared to fulfill the desires described in the ad. At first, the victim did not know why this was happening. She soon learned of the internet ads and put a note on her front door explaining that they were fake. Della Penta didn't back off though and began stating in the ads that the notes were part of the twisted fantasy. The woman's father responded to the post, pretending to be interested and traced their source. Della Penta received a six year prison sentence after pleading guilty to one count of stalking and three counts of solicitation of sexual assault. Number two, John Hinckley Jr. On March 30th, 1981, someone shot and nearly killed then-President Ronald Reagan outside a Washington, D.C. hotel. The culprit also fired bullets into Reagan's press secretary, Jim Brady, Secret Service agent Tim McCarthy, and a police officer. These near tragedies were part of a man named John Hinckley Jr.'s warped plan to impress actor Jodie Foster. A judge found Hinckley not guilty by reason of insanity and ordered him to the care of a psychiatric facility where he remained until 2016, when he was discharged and went to live with his mother. Hinckley had gradually earned privileges over the years, including extended leaves from the facility. Authorities and mental health providers continued to keep a close eye on the troubled man after his release. And two years after regaining his freedom, a judge permitted Hinckley to move out of his mother's house and even to drive unaccompanied. He went on to live in his own house and ran an antiquities business. But Hinckley's life of freedom has reportedly not been what he imagined it to be. Dating has been a struggle, and he's had some serious health problems. But it's undoubtedly better than the life sentence he may have received if he had been found guilty of his alleged crimes. Number 1. Angel Rodriguez Gomez Having easy access to cameras on cell phones has been a game changer. The ability to do this really came in handy for a Maryland woman named Hannah Viverette when a man broke into her second floor apartment through her balcony while she was filming herself dancing for a TikTok video. Footage of the alarming incident shows a visibly startled Hannah asking the man who he was and telling her Alexa device to turn off her music. She asked the man to leave her home several times before he creepily asked her, am I your friend? She responded no, to which the man said, are you sure? Yes, she replied, grabbing her cell phone and repeatedly demanding for him to leave. She ran to a neighbor's and began banging on their door, and finally, the man retreated from the scene. Two days later, police brought Angel Moises Rodriguez Gomez in for questioning. Not only were they armed with footage of the encounter, she also recognized him as a resident of a nearby building. Rodriguez Gomez was arrested but released on bond, which was unsettling for Hannah to say the least. Despite her fears prompting her to stay elsewhere immediately following the incident, Hannah vowed that the man would not stop her from eventually returning to her apartment or continuing to make her dancing videos for TikTok. Thanks for watching. What one of these stalker stories was the creepiest to you? Let me know in the comments below and don't forget to subscribe for more videos like this one.